So good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm, uh, I've been asked to talk about accuracy. Um, this is by far something I worry about a lot. I mean, I'm coming more from a material discovery point of view, and definitely you want to be accurate if you make a prediction. Uh, and I'm, I, I think for the, just, to, just, just to start a discussion that we'll have after, I just picked two examples of studies of accuracy that we did. And I, instead of the result, I think the, the key points of the challenges and issue we face when we do this type of study, I'm going to try to highlight that. And so it, it, I think really the context is if you b want to become predictive, you need to worry about accuracy, definitely. Um, and, and this is actually not only for DFT, even things that we will still feel like G, G0, W0, I mean, great, that's the best you can do. There is still approximation beyond that, so you should worry about it even if you have beyond DFT methods. Um, and something I always uh, often uh, encounter as a question when I say I may do materials discovery with computation, say, oh, but it's all about approximation. You cannot use something that's approximate. I would argue that it's okay to be inaccurate when you know how much inaccurate you are. And we make in your life decisions with partial information all the time. And that's, that's a very, I mean, that's sometimes something we, we forget. Um, one of the things, I mean, it's nice to have somebody from the quantum chemistry community. Um, definitely, this is just a feeling. Maybe it's wrong, but I think they're doing a much better job in terms of several ways they do uh, accuracy benchmarks. Uh, and I think we should learn from them. Uh, there's actually not much uh, gold standards we all agree on on many things we compute. Uh, and also, even the data set sometimes. I mean, in, in chemistry, you have a series of data sets that, that, uh, that you can all agree on. And in the whole community, it tends to be that everybody, when running an accuracy test, makes its own data set, which can bring a lot of bias. And, and that's something we should be aware of. Maybe as a community, I mean, I'm not the first person to say that. And it's definitely a there discussion and efforts, but I don't see it really coming. We should agree on data sets that we all compare without everybody picking his own data set, including myself, by the way. I mean, it's not the... So, uh, because you don't have these gold standards usually, I mean, you have to rely on experimental data, and I want really to stress a, f a few of the challenges uh, when you deal with experimental data. Um, actually, it's, you have to always worry about, is it really directly comparable to your initial computation? I mean, a single crystal versus polycrystal, pure sample, Temperature, I mean, do you have, I mean, if I look at thermodynamic data, they are all reported at 298K. If I do energy computation, this is 0K. So how much do I compare that? Um, diverse, there's strong biases. Uh, if you look at the no knowledge we have on oxides compared to the knowledge we have on nitride, it's, it's I mean, there's plenty of more, an order of magnitude more oxides are unknown. So you have all these biases in your data sets. Uh, hopefully it will be large, and usually the experimental data sets that we have are small, uh, relatively small. And I would argue that, that we, I mean, this is something to the experimentalist, uh, we might be bad because we don't have error bars, but as the experimentalist, how often they report error bars. I mean, I don't see, when I see a band gap in a paper, uh, that's from a from fit on a, some optical absorption, often even the experimentalist doesn't report any error bar. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, thing. And then, uh, having several sources is always good. It's just a way to kind of uh, check the problem, uh, if there's any problem. And, and uh, something that's important for certain computation more than other, uh, I think automatically doing this computation, there's a point to be, I mean, make on, on uh, going from automatic to manual, and also doing things automatically might remove some biases. Uh, so I picked two examples of, of, I mean, I might not have much time on this one, but actually this is a pretty old study, but it really illustrates a lot of the points I made. Um, and this was on accuracy of PBE, very simple functional in predicting formation, not any formation energies, but, but certain uh, more relevant form formation energies, I would say. And then a the second one from uh, actually with many people that are in audience here uh, on the band gap accuracy in GW. Um, I think I, I want to make the point of the important formation energy. This is something that's super important as far as I'm concerned, I'm trying to make predict new compounds, and usually when you predict two comp new compounds, what do you do? You, let's say you pick a composition, then you suggest structures, all kinds of structure you can think of. That, that's challenging, but there are ways to do that. And then you test for stability. You compute or they compete with each other. So you want that to be accurate, uh, hopefully, to make your prediction. Uh, and does it work? I mean, this is actually, let's talk about the problems. Let's talk about the achievements also. This is actually a series of materials 
uh, that have been, they were motivated to be synthesized by computation. So this is a nice list of materials that didn't exist. Nobody had ever made this structure in this chemistry. And the computer said, you know, there's something that should be stable there with this structure. I mean, and the experimentalists went to the lab and, and made it afterwards. And so these are true predictions. Um, there's one recent one that I really like from actually Shui Ping Hong, who was uh, uh, here at the Abini Developer Workshop. And this is a new phosphor material. And this phase, strontium, lithium, aluminum oxide, was, had never been made. And so he did a study finding new structures and, and tested for stability versus all competing phases and ended up saying, okay, that one should be an uh, First of all, this should exist. Nobody has ever made it. And second of all, it's a good, interesting phosphor. So there are actually more and more of this example. But to get back to accuracy, when we do that, what we do is we, we compare, we do this convex soil construction uh, at first at 0k, at least at the first step. And then you compare stability of, let's say, one given AB compound versus the composition to all possibilities. And that's what you want to have accurate, this type of, of uh, reaction energies. And so in a multi-component system, this can be quite complex with, for instance, a ternary competing with binary phases. Uh, and when you do these cuts, you can see that if ABC2 will be or not stable is depending on what's the energy versus A2C and B2C. And so in b 2 c 3 So this is the relevant uh, reaction energy, I would argue. And when, when, when we did this work in 2012, I think there were already, actually this is 2008, not 2018, sorry. Uh, there were already some work, and, but they were looking at formation energies from the elements. And they were terrible, 200 MeV per atom. I mean, I'm, I was, we were actually surprised. We said, how can we make any like, convex cell with that type of error? So we were super surprised by that. It was like, OK, can we? Then we, we went back to the Romberg and said, can we actually look? We know there's constellation of errors in DFT. So can we actually look at the relevant reaction energies to or phase stability and see how these are doing? And so we did this process to actually focus not on formation energy from the elements, but, but reaction energies from, let's say, a binary to a ternary. Um, so I'm going to take that and I'm going to comment. And it's nice because it's my work, so I can criticize it without offending anyone except myself. Um, so is it directly comparable? I mean, that you can uh, discuss. These are polycrystalline powder samples. We tried as much as possible to extrapolate back, but it's not perfect, to 0K to 298 Kelvin uh, using the, the heat capacity uh, we had. These are from thermodynamic, thermodynamic data. So you have enthalpies at 298K and often Heat capacity. So we tried, but this is not a perfect uh, a way of dealing with that. So it's that problem. Is it di diverse? Not diverse at all, actually. It's mainly oxides. Um, but that tells at least something. Uh, is it large? If you think that 150 points <laughs> is large, that's, that, that's the number of points we could actually find. Uh, nice is that we, we had error bars with this data set. Um, so, and it's around 10 MeV per atom in average. So it's also an interesting point. This, it's going to be very challenging to go lower than that or in terms of to make a statement that you're doing better than that if the experimentalist cannot measure better than 10 MeV per atom in terms of enthalpies. Um, and so and we use several sources. And one of the things we did is every time we had one data point, we only accepted it if it was present in several sources. And if there was a big discrepancy between two sources, we just throw it away. Um, and infrastructure is not a big problem here. There's a relatively easy uh, automat to automatize computations. Uh, the results, I mean, you can basically see that at least uh, things correlate well. Um, so that, that's OK. But I wanted to go more into, I mean, the, the type of distribution you get. You get something pretty much center around 0. But you get, don't get that if you look at formation energies from the elements. And the standard deviation is around 24 uh, MeV per atom. That's including, actually, the uncertainty this is a model excluding the uncertainty from the experiment also in there to assess. And so this is, a, this is much lower. Remember, this was 200 versus 24. And this is why we can actually make reasonable phase diagram. It's all about cancellation of errors. So I think you should always look at the thing you, you, you really worry about. Um, there's actually more recent work that was done, um, I mean, doing pretty similar things. Uh, this is 2019, so very, um, I mean, very just came out. And the conclusion is pretty similar. It's another data set, so it's nice to see another data set, other group doing something quite similar and finding uh, a similar result, 30 MeV per atoms. Uh, that's what they found with 25. Uh, one thing, I mean, talking about scan, 
I, I didn't look in details, but they did that exactly with scan, and they found no improvement. So uh, when you have constellation of errors, PBE might be doing as well as scan. If you, I'm pretty sure if you look from the elemental energies, then scan is doing better. So we need to know what, what we are correcting for. Um, so I think uh, that being said, I, I really need to look more into this. Um, the other um, work I want to mention is this work we did on band gaps for GW, G0, W0. And this is work from, oops, from Mikhail actually who's here. Um, and so let's look at back at this, this, this. The idea there was to compare, I mean, there's two, uh, two things. First of all, automatizing GW calculations. That was the first thing of the paper. And then there was, a, I mean, using that to actually benchmark uh, versus experiment. So is it directly comparable? Again, temperature effects are, can be problematic here. They can be between, I think, estimates from Mikhail between 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 EV of purely temperature effect. And usually the reported band gaps are, are not at 0K. They reported at room temperature. So can we go much lower than that if we don't even know the uh, uh, 0K uh, band gap? Um, diverse, I mean, I think I would say this is okay in terms of diversity. Large, we have seven, 78 compounds that we're pretty, I mean, pretty certain about the band gap, and 31 were actually extrapolated to zero Kelvin. Um, uh, error bars, I think there was no error bar uh, at all. I mean, or at least every data point had not one error bar. Uh, in the enthalpy data, you can have one data, I mean, it's not a general error bar. You can have one data point with a huge error bar and then one with another error bar. That you don't really see with this data source. And the several sources, we actually used the source from a previous paper instead of Delta Salt paper from, from Getz Cedar and, and Maya Chan that actually did the work of, of picking all of band gaps. Uh, and we did our own uh, look at this data. And this is actually critical here. This is done automatically. So that means conversions with GW can be tricky. And so I think this is, might be a less biased way of doing things. We cannot be in a situation where we converge until we're pretty happy with the result. This is done by the computer. And this is stopped when the computer is happy with the result. And the computer doesn't know the band gap of, let's say, zinc oxide. Okay? So I think that's another point to make is doing going automatic is good to remove biases. Um, these are the results. Uh, I agree, totally agree that we should always compare with simple things. In the paper here, we compare GGA versus G0, W0 on PBE, actually. So that's important. The starting point is some, it's important. And we also compare to a simple shift of the PBE. Uh, the good news is, I think, the G if I remember, the GW still do better than a sim simple shift. But we should always, I agree with the previous speaker, we should always compare with simple things. Um, and so uh, one of the questions I wanted, I mean, one of the, as far as I'm concerned, I wanted to really, I mean, there are a lot of people estimating band gap with HEC, and then you have uh, GW, and so can we, can we compare what we're doing in a limited set of band gap range, 0 0.5 to 4 EV, which is, I think, what HEC typical parameters tend to uh, target. And so what is the most accurate technique for, for more data set? And, and since I have a lot of uh, experts here, I can ask you, who's, I mean, there's three choices. GW, and this is this type of GW, huh? this is G, G0, W0 at PB, on PB. So this is one specific case of PB, of GW. How GW does versus HSC for band gaps in non-transition metal materials, who's winning there? So you have three options. GW wins, HSC wins, or they're pretty similar. So who thinks GW wins? OK. I mean, yeah, there. I mean, at least they're there saying something. And then who thinks HSC wins? OK. <laughs> and who thinks they're pretty similar? I mean, you cannot vote, Jean Marco. You, you're in the paper. <laughs> I mean, actually, I mean, we'll see if you remember the results of the paper. Let's say. <laughs> so, and actually, I would argue they're pretty similar if you remove transition metals. I mean, that was the, the conclusion. So if you look at transition metals containing uh, compounds, who thinks GW wins? This type of GW, of course, this type. Who thinks HSC wins? Huh? It's pretty good. And so indeed, you get the, or it's actually, yeah, you get a higher, a slightly higher error uh, with GW. And so I think it's interesting. I mean, we're all, bio, I mean, we're all experts in DFT here, and all this, this simple uh, thing uh, really need more um, statistical assessments uh, to compare those methods. And of course, I'm not saying any GW would do that. There's plenty of flavors of GW. This is one flavor of GW. 
Um, so in conclusion, I think it's really needed to be predictive, to do accuracy assessment. These are two examples, but I worry about accuracy all the time. Um, lack of computed gold standards is, is a drawback in solids. And there's a challenge in dealing with experimental data, and the challenge, I mean, it's painful. I mean, I mean, I can ask, Mikhail, is it painful to work with getting all these experimental band gaps and making sure they're right? I did the work on the enthalpy, that was super painful. It's a painful job. And so really, really painful, and Curtis also <laughs> nodding their head. Uh, so this is, uh, this is really something, maybe a, a community effort could be useful there. Uh, and beware the way of you compute things, uh, automatize, I mean, I mean, uh, Peter Bla was saying that you need a, a, a good expert to run the computation. I would argue that maybe we need also computers to run the computation that are not biases. Um, and, uh, and experts know a lot, but, but they can be also biased by the, the method they like or the physics they, they think is going on. Thank you.